We are proud to announce the 2019 Palisade Global Hard Asset Conference, taking place on Jackal Island from May 16th to May 20th. Speakers confirmed include legendary mining investor Paul Matizek, former hedge fund manager Mike Alkin, and resource managing partner Matt Geiger, plus many more to be announced. Sign up now for more details and to be included in our special guest list. Join us in Jackal Island to become part of a growing number of investors who are ready to take advantage of a coming resource boom. Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. I'm your guest host, Karema Mutlu, and on today's show, we have Executive Chairman of Copper Bank Resources, Gianni Kovosevic. How are you today, Gianni? Very good, thank you. Let's begin by talking about the future demand for copper and the electrification of major transport systems globally. You have actually driven an electric vehicle across America and Europe. So would you suggest that the infrastructure is now starting to fall into place for EVs to become a reality within the next few years? And what did that experience show you about the possibilities for an electric vehicle future? Well, I drove an electric car across America and across Europe to demonstrate that the future is now. Your question is, the increase of electrification and what will that mean for copper. In the long, long run, almost all of our energy becomes electrified. But what is underappreciated and under-researched by global investors is that today, as we speak, for final energy usage, only 19% is electrification. And that took 120 years to get to this point. Now, you can, there's many prognostications on what's going to happen in the future, but the average is in the next 30 to 40 years, over 50% of final energy usage is going to be electrification. Think of the gravity of that statistic and the power of magnitude. Uh, more conductors, generators, the, the transfer of energy, the way we use it. This is, there's only two ways to make that possible, Karim. That's gonna be aluminum and copper, and copper wins the marathon. And on top of this, the, the, the absolute percentage that's gonna be electrified, we're talking about things, buses, cars, garbage trucks, your wind power, solar power. Right now, it's all at the margin. But as going forward, this stuff tar- it starts to take center stage where it, it, it has a bigger and bigger percentage. The kegger growth rate for copper is going to be higher than the 120-year average. I don't lose any sleep at night that that's the case because there is no substitute at this point for copper other than aluminum. And aluminum simply does not work in many applications in the electrification of global energy. It, it plays a parallel role for certain applications but not the lion's share. Before the interview, you sent me a couple of charts regarding the copper price and the crude oil price, and the chart confirms that copper is actually decoupling from oil. So why is this important? People can view this on on your website, but it is over 90% of the time, copper is directly correlated to oil. How can this be? In fact, you can take a basket of commodities. That's because oil is the dominant commodity. So at the margin, the... The the highs are with the highs, the lows are with the lows. That is no longer possible because copper requires significantly higher prices. If the world wants the the low-grade resources that we found as an industry, the $100 billion that we invested, expiration over the past 15 years during the China super cycle, all of that, almost all of it, is lower than 0.5% copper. And I could show you this. I can show you 50 projects in a chart. And then I can show it to you graphically with the demarcation line as being 0.5. And the engineering tells us that copper is going to have to have uh, a price to make that. Though that type of ore has to be worth 40 or $50 a ton. That's an engineering term. Don't, people don't get confused by that. But basically, that correlates to better than $10,000 a ton for copper or $4.5 a pound. Now, if you look at this chart, that would indicate that copper is going to have to exceed its old all-time high. That would be like oil being $130, $140 a barrel. Other than politics, 
I don't see any fundamentals that are going to drive oil to, to that level. So if you look at that that 18 year correlation, I believe if, as we update this six months forward every six months, it's going to become very obvious. And that is exactly where you want to invest things that are un, sort of underappreciated or under researched by the market. And so what I believe is right now a page 16 story. This is going to end up on page one. And that is where uh, I think there's a big opportunity in this trade where, you, where you're going long, the future of energy or electrification copper and short some aspect or some strategy within the incumbent energy mix, be it a component, a commodity or an application. Long copper, short um, fossil fuels in some category. Very good. For many investors, when we talk about the demands for certain commodities like cobalt, lithium or nickel, electric vehicles seem to be thought of immediately as the main drive for new demand for these commodities, but not so much for copper yet. When will this shift in general investor perception change for copper? Well, I think it's happening in real time. And those are, are those are niche metals. They all had their day in the sun and there's going to be increased demand for them. Uh, cobalt, everyone knows people are talking about the substitution or the elimination of cobalt. And you'll hear very, very smart people will tell you it's not possible. Other ones will tell you they're working on it. And it's going to come in the next sort of five, six, seven years. Now, lithium, there's lots of it. You now have the big integrated international mining companies getting involved. They're going to they're going to have new product for the market. We're going to have countless millions more batteries. So yes, we need more lithium, but can they provide that? I think the answer is yes. Copper has not had this, um, it's it's sort of renaissance where we've had this underinvestment after Cobra Panama is commissioned sort of in the first part of this year, we go into a two and a half, three year window where there's no major copper mines that are gonna be coming online. We've also had this underinvestment and I think there's all uh, unless we get this higher copper price you simply cannot even contemplate taking these lower grade resources and, and making them economic deposits so it, it has to wait for the copper price uh, warehouse levels have have, uh, have dwindled they're down to uh, between Sheffy Comex and the LME we're down to about 350,000 tons uh, the question is what's off warrant how much copper is sitting there as money or or, or as a buffer for for various traders or fabricators and uh, the, the the answer is it's not going to be enough to satisfy this this kegger growth rate of four or five percent mike tyson had famously used to say that everyone has a plan until they're punched in the face and that's what's happening with the global fabricators one of the largest buyers of copper told me he says you realize nobody cares for how high copper prices doesn't mean they're manipulating it but it's basically those 15 copper ceos that produce copper against the world so if you use that mike tyson analogy these purchasing managers have, have had it very good for seven or eight years. All of that goes out the window when something happens, when there's a, 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 a pronounced supply deficit or when there's a major problem at a major mine and, and all of a sudden it's a scramble for copper or metal. Then come the traders and they're the ones that exacerbate the price, lower and higher. So we're, we're, we're at a precipice right now. We're on an onion skin. Last June, before the, the trade tariffs were implemented by the U.S. government, um, copper was trying to test $3.30 a pound three times. And then all of a sudden, these fabricators could go back to hand to mouth. So we're, we're already pricing in, I think, in many of these commodities, the worst case scenario in a trade tariff situation. If that doesn't occur, watch out. But even so, we still end up with a supply deficit. And I believe the copper price has to go significantly higher. Otherwise, you are not going to get any new uh, copper production. And, and we've already went through a six or seven year uh, period of consolidation. Very good. As electric vehicles become more efficient and cheaper to build for the batteries in particular, does this in fact increase the need for copper? And what implications does that have going forward? Well, yeah, copper is pervasive throughout the energy matrix. So that's energy storage, be it in a battery for your house or a battery for a car or a battery for any other application. But it's also used in the utilization of the distribution of all of our electrical energy, including locally and when it goes from point A to point B. But then well, when we go upstream and we're talking about the actual creation of the electrical energy, which, which we know is going to occur increasingly so with solar power and wind power at a commercial scale, these things take four, five, six X more copper per megawatt of application, power of magnitude more. So if you look at 
um, so the statistics, is Royal Dutch Shell has already uh, come out with various scenarios. And if you look at the middle of the road today, 19% of final energy usage is electrification. And that's going to increase to over 50% in the next 30 years or so. I mean, think of the think of the gravity of that statement. It took us 120 years to get to the 19% point, And we did that before mining 2% and 1% copper. And now we're mining 0.65 and 0.6% copper. This is going to happen with three times more electrification in one third the time. I mean, this is, you, you do not have to get out a pencil and paper and worry about it as an analyst. There is going to be significant demand growth for copper because this, the electrification of the world is enabled with two things, aluminum and copper, and they will both play a role. But aluminum cannot fulfill the, the, the characteristics that copper offers throughout various applications. And just to one, one more recap, of all the copper that's fabricated today, 75% of it goes into something to um, generate, transfer, or utilize electrical energy. 25% is for enhanced products, piping, air conditioning, and other applications. Investors um, should, should be, based, be very optimistic on uh, demand growth for copper, and the opportunity, of course, goes into those um, what are now uneconomic supplies. They, they in, I, in my view, will become or have to become economic, which means it's like a little insurance policy that the copper price is going much higher. The fact that many copper discoveries are low grade does not help finance certain projects for future development. And the capex for a copper porphyry deposit, for example, is far greater than it used to be. So where will the incentive for continued exploration for new deposits come from? Would it simply be a higher copper price? That's a tough one because the industry invested over $100 billion looking for, for new resources. This was during the China super cycle, which many of your listeners were probably participated in. We did not have a lot of success. Uh, the, the, there was less than 10 world-class discoveries in that period. And we found a lot of low-grade resources. So I don't believe larger companies and mid-tier mining companies are going to go back on a global adventure doing exploration. I think what they will do is they'll go to those uh, what's already been delineated or already a, a resource and, and basically enhance and, and look at the, end, the final engineering for, for those projects to become commercially viable. And with, you know, 50% of, of copper, primary copper comes from effectively two countries, Peru and Chile. Wait till the macro or the, the global energy investors realize that. If, we, if they think we rely on, on oil from the Middle East, which is 20% of oil production comes from the Middle East, wait till they find out two countries provide 50% of the world's copper. And if you look at the 25 mines that give us 50% uh, of primary copper production, most of them, they are not aware of this. I asked the I ask this or provide this statistic to them in um, in meetings around the world. And this is a shocker. So this is coming, as Robert Friedland would say, coming to a theater near you, and it's a classic, classic story on page 16 that I believe is headed to page one above the fold, and that is where hiding in plain sight, and it starts to come to the full in 2019, 2020, 2021, because you have a few things happening in your favor. One, you've had an underinvestment for seven or eight years. Two, there's no major copper mines coming online for the next three years. Uh, three, warehouse levels have come to almost all-time lows. Four, uh, 2018 was one of the luckiest years for supply disruption, less than 2%, saved the day, in fact. Um, and now you have this never-ending new customer for copper demand, which is electrification. The last time this happened in the early 2000s, which took everyone off guard, was China. China was the new customer. And they just kept absorbing, absorbing, absorbing. And this, and that, that happened in the beginning, sort of, it was hiding in plain sight. Same thing is happening in the pervasive um, uh, shift to electrific, in the electrification of energy and, and copper's role in that to enable that to, to occur. Excellent. As we wrap up the show, Gianni, is there anything else you'd like to discuss with our listeners today? Yeah, just to wrap up a couple of uh, good ideas, uh, obviously uh, for myself, I like the optionality in copper. So uh, our strategy called Copper Bank is something that they could look at where it's, um, it has downside protection because we've been acquiring um, established ask copper projects that have had tens of millions of dollars spent on them. And now we are holding them for, um, as the, co the, the copper price normalizes, we have optionality, but also growth and development uh, 
with our projects. And the last time copper prices moved about 40, 50%, the copper bank moved 400%. So it's, it's disproportionate to the copper price. So if you like this uh, copper idea, and if you feel copper prices could move higher, take a look at the copper price the past four years, and then people can look at copper bank and how that performed. So that's a good speculation. Another thing that's uh, not been talked about by, by sort of uh, global investors is helium. Helium has been in a, in a bull market. The, the, the latest auction that happened last year, it's now going for $280, whereas natural gas sells for $4. You drill it the same way, it costs about the same to drill for a helium well, uh, but it's far rarer. The, 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 the level of success is far lower. So I'm participating in a speculation, a company called Desert Mountain Energy, the symbols DME on the TSXV. They are going to drill three speculation exploration wells on the prolific uh, New Mexico-Arizona border. And I think people need to look at that. So if you look at the risk reward, um, if they're successful in this area, and they are about 2,500 feet from one of the most prolific helium wells in America. So it's a closeology. It's being drilled by competent people. It's financed, and you can look for that to uh, to, to get going. I think people need to follow the helium story because that's that's something that's going to come to the front page here in 2019. And that's a company that's actually uh, has acquired uh, successfully BLM claims. They're financed, and they're going to start drilling in the first half of 2019. Follow that one, and uh, for disclosure, obviously, I own it. Great. Well, thank you very much today, Johnny, and we'll have you back on the show again very soon. Thank you. People can follow me on Twitter as well, and uh, just type in my name and you'll see me there. I always provide you know, macro data and charts and such. Excellent. Very good. Thank you. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bid. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?